Hello everyone and welcome back to the Film Score Podcast. Although it's Halloween, I unfortunately don't have a spooky episode for you. Instead, I've got a, another composer interview. Today I'm talking with composer Michael Uzerski. Michael's recently had some great scores in the horror film The Vigil, as well as the David Ayer-helmed The Tax Collector. And now we touch on both of those a little bit in this interview, but we spend most of the time talking about his latest project, which is the score he co-composed with avant-garde jazz trumpeter Ambrose Ekinmusuri, and it's for the new Stars TV show Blindspotting. Unfortunately, Ambrose was originally scheduled to join us as well, but had to drop out at the last second. It's a shame it would have been great to chat with both of them, but maybe we'll save that for season two. Blind Spotting's a really cool score. It's really like a free-form jazz that melds with some of the really interesting narrative and stylistic choices of the series, and you'll hear all about that in the coming minutes. I actually thought it was a great show, too. I wasn't familiar with the movie, and fortunately you don't need to have seen the movie beforehand, but it really resonated with me emotionally, and I can't wait to see what they do when, hopefully, Season 2 comes out as well. Now, you can find more information on Michael's website, or find him on social media, and, as always, you can do the same for me. However, you can find me on a horror-related podcast episode that recently released. It's on the show Track Swaps, under the umbrella of Sideshow Sound Radio. And in that, the host and I talk about two horror cues, one from Philip Glass's Candyman and one from Pascal Gagné's Aramentari. It's a lot of fun, and if you like hearing me drone on and on about film music, I recommend checking it out. Now, have a good Halloween, and sit back and enjoy. Michael, I'm so glad you could join me today. How have you been? I've uh, been great. Thank you so much for having me. And uh, I'm, you know, I'm a fan of the podcast. I've listened to it a couple of times. So, um, so you know, thank you for, uh, thank you for your passion and your, <laughs> you know, your enthusiasm for film music. I think it's rare. And you know, every time I meet someone who's passionate about film music, it's like I always want to say thank you because it's it's an art form that that we ourselves are passionate about, and we're always trying to drum up more interest in and more awareness of the craft and the art involved. Well, thank you. I, I appreciate that. And honestly, it's it's so nice having, I feel like I say this too often, but it's so nice of film music, video game music, TV music. There are so many great composers and there's so much great music that I feel so utterly spoiled. So <laughs> we're all we're all fortunate too. Yeah, it's an embarrassment of riches out there. <laughs> I was uh, very happy to be able to do this interview. I've heard your scores for The Vigil and The Tax Collector, both film scores that I really enjoyed, both quite different as well, especially compared to Blind Spotting. So even in just three very recent pieces, you've shown this huge breadth of musical stylings that you're comfortable with. So is that something that's always been there, or has that just come with with time? Uh, I always tend to joke around that I, I get bored very, very easily. <laughs> and I don't like to repeat myself either. So, um, But it's funny because it was almost a directive that I gave myself like from a young age that, you know, when I first started composing, that I wanted to write in different styles. I wanted to try and master different styles. And partly because, you know, I had this insatiable curiosity for music. It's like, how does music work? How do the pieces fit together? I would listen deeply to recordings and film scores, classical works, jazz works, anything, and just try and get to the bottom of how did they do that? Like, what are the pieces? Like, I see the, I see the jigsaw puzzle and it's all put together, but like, if I was going to pull out all the individual pieces, what would they look like? And so that kind of led me into this exploration of different styles. And then from there, I started to f- sort of find my own way in. The tax collection and the vigil were two genres that I was always been very very interested in you know in terms of film music I loved horror scores I've grown up on them I I think some of the most interesting avant-garde work gets done in the horror genre so I'm always looking for horror projects that I can really sink my teeth into for that reason and then similarly with the tax collector in terms of sort of action drama scoring that's another area of music that I've been really passionate about and interesting it's like how can you blend emotion and drama into action and fear so that's how I approach those two particular projects Uh, and they don't really relate to each other in any way other than I wanted to see how I could explore that genre 
and then of course with blind spotting uh, it sort of took me in a different direction not the least which because i had a collaborator which again i don't usually have so for me jumping around is part of who i am it makes me hard to define as a composer which sometimes can be a problem in hollywood it's like well oh, what does michael do so, well he kind of does everything well yeah you always like everybody says that they can do everything you know that's the classic thing it's like he can do everything and it's like well in my case it's hopefully true at least in some certain genres and that's that's where i so i haven't seen the blind spotting film and unfortunately i i checked and i couldn't find a score release for it because i was very curious as to you know is there a musical through line or is it is the series something totally different. But for people who haven't seen the series yet, it's a much more jazz-based score. There's a lot of almost free form in it. And I think part of that comes through in there's a lot of spoken word, almost rapping, like poetry, breaking the fourth wall. Mm. And the music can serve as a backdrop of that. Actually, I loved that aspect of the series and your music because it, it reminded me of some aspects of beat poetry where you had these poets giving spoken word performances while there was a jazz band in the background and merging the two art forms. So I don't know if that's something that you and Ambrose drew on, but I immediately made that connection and made it all the more powerful and interesting to me. Yeah, well, to your first point, there's no real through line from the film to the series in terms of style or musical motifs even. There really isn't. That was very deliberate. The series of Blind Spotting, while it takes place in the same world with a couple of the same characters, it really is tangential to the film. So it's it's an offshoot. And so we made the decision very early on in collaboration with the creatives, with um, Raphael Cazal, David Diggs, Keith Calder, and Jessica Calder, that the world of the television series, the musical world of the television series, was going to be different. And part of that was aided by the fact that we brought in Ambrose, you know, to work with me. And we had this very, very equal collaboration. We decided we didn't want to bring anything over from the film because that would sort of imply in a way that the music of the film or the melodies that I wrote in the film had sort of some sort of superiority just by the mm. fact that they already existed. And we didn't want that. We wanted to start from scratch, to start from zero and build from the ground up. A lot of the feeling of the of the television show it comes from that collaboration, comes from sort of throwing ideas back and forth from Los Angeles, where I'm based, to Oakland, where he's based, and just coming up with a sound that was unique and different and perfectly, hopefully, fits the world of the show. In terms of the free form and the beat poetry that you were talking about, that is one aspect that was in the film. You know, the characters do this wonderful breaking the fourth wall and, and sort of seamlessly gliding from dialogue or what we would understand to be traditional dialogue into verse. And the score in the movie and in the television show kind of navigates that transition without making it obvious. So, you know, it's not a musical. That's That was very important back in the movie and with the television show. It's not like now we're into verse and a song starts. You know, the transitions have to be seamless. We don't really, as an audience, want to know from the music that we're entering a different narrative technique it's the technique itself of sliding into verse that that is the carryover from the movie but the musical underlay is quite different because ambrose brought a lot of his aesthetic to the score and like you said the freeform jazz all of that really comes from ambrose and and his particular musical voice which is unique even in jazz you know he has this incredible tone which is to me unmatched i've never heard anyone get a tone out of the trumpet like he gets it, it, I mean he is he is a master and he brought not just as a player but as a composer this incredibly unique perspective to the music of the series to your first point I think it's really impressive how seamlessly those transitions are in the show and it's the same thing with the ballet sequences or kind of the and I don't want to pigeonhole it just into that because it's it's a broader expressive dance that comes in and out too and it just comes really naturally. Like you said, it's not a hard break of here we are in traditional dialogue and traditional acting and whatever. And then, bam, OK, now we have this set piece of right. a big dance number. It just moves right through. The dancing of the, um, the verse comes in and then it slides right back out. That has to be a little difficult to have the music from the traditional, what we'd say a traditional you know, TV, to then slide into those and then slide back out. I mean, was that a, a challenge to make it so it isn't an abrupt, obvious change? So the process of the show was quite interesting. I think it's worth talking about that and how the, how the actual, how the creative 
development behind the music was expressed to us. We started composing in November last year, and this was actually before they were, sh were shooting. And we were given a few scenes that needed to be choreographed. Uh, on camera. For those of you who haven't seen the show, there is a there is an on camera chorus of dancers, and they're the same dancers through the eight episodes, kind of in different roles, playing different roles, but always as the on screen dancer chorus. And we were given a couple of those moments prior to the shoot to to explore through music. We were given the brief. This is what's going to happen in this scene. This is what it represents. We need about two or three minutes of music. It's going to be at the end of episode four. Or it's going to be in episode eight. Go. You know, and that was kind of it. So the question was, what feeling are you trying to evoke? You know, is this a slow piece? Is it a fast piece? What are you hearing? There's a little bit of back and forth. But then apart from that, we were really left to our own devices to explore the sound world. And these were the first pieces that Ambrose and I wrote together. So they actually became the perfect vehicles to begin a collaboration. One of the pieces was actually the piece that ends episode four. We call it Childhood. It's the dance through the house. And it's rep you know represents uh, two of the legacy characters from the film growing up from childhood to adulthood as as the camera pans with them through the house. And we were only given about two and a half days to write the piece. I think the the choreographers called us on a Monday and they were shooting on Wednesday. They're like, "Hey, we had this idea. Do you want to?" And so we wrote it really quickly. Ambrose. Uh, wrote something, then I wrote something, then you know we we were just basically building this track, sending it back and forth until we had something, and then we sent it off. And pretty much that version, that initial kind of demo version that we did, is the final version that you hear. Like they really, it didn't really change. And similarly with episode eight as well, there's a dance that the character Earl does in episode eight that we wrote early on and the pretty much that final version you know it just really didn't change so those two pieces oh and actually a, a few of the other dance sequences were kind of unique in the process hmm. when we got to the other side of the shoot a lot of the pieces to camera were shot without music behind them so it was then our job to transition them from score to or traditional score to these narrative sequences to these uh, you know pieces to camera then back into traditional underscore without sort of implying to the audience that something had changed you know we, like everything kind of had to be every day like these are not fantasy sequences this is human reality this is an inner dialogue this is a personal narrative and it's as relevant and as, as important to the story as the action on screen in the scenes before and after. And I think that's an interesting aspect of it. And the effect works well, where you as the viewer then kind of enter into the mind of these these characters as they're having these daydreams or conversations with themselves or like you're talking about in the end of episode four where Ashley's watching this dance unfold and then you kind of enter her headspace and see the characters growing up. One of the interesting aspects of that, too, is so often for recording for media, you're getting, even if you're brought on early, pre-script even, you're still eventually going to be scoring the picture or turning what you've already written and morphing it into fit to picture. Right. However, this, it's such a rare circumstance where you've actually written part of what ends up being the score prior to it ever being scored or mm. being uh, shot. And then they're matching everything to fit the music. Was that kind of a surprise for you to finally, when you see the picture lock, to then see those dance sequences with, with your music to it? When you're dealing with choreography, it wasn't a surprise to see that they had used all our timings and, mm -hmm. and phrasing. I think the biggest surprise I was talking about is the fact that that really the music didn't change vertically, like in the sense that we didn't add anything to it. We didn't add layers. We didn't we didn't add production. We didn't get the note that you know. Oh, it needs more energy. It needs to be bigger. Or it need, you know, like can we really kick this along? It was it was pretty much the intention, the purity of the intention that we had that matched the intention of the dancers was untouched. And that's a different process to. Like you said, if we had scored demos for themes or for characters or for even to go under the verses, then it's likely that, yeah, that would have changed a bit because the tone is slightly different or the, you know, the speed of the of the scenes and, you know, things change in the edit. So and all of that did happen. But specifically in regard to the dancers, the surprise and the delightful surprise for us was that it really stayed true to that original improvisation that Ambrose and I put together. And I think that's a great example of it, where it sounds like in this project, 
you two had far more creative freedom than I think happens a lot. Oh, definitely. Yeah, yeah, no question. I think the trust that was put into us by Keith and Jess, Rafa and David was was extraordinary. And not only that, I mean, they matched us. Obviously, I'd worked with them on the film, but they knew Ambrose's work and they had this idea. They were like, well, you know what? We should bring these guys together because we love Ambrose's sound. We love the music that Michael did on the music. We actually think that something greater could occur when we put these guys together. And I would argue that it, yeah, it did, you know, that, that I think that we brought different perspectives and different life experience to the music. And just even that in itself, we were allowed to channel all of that into the score. I mean, Ambrose grew up in Oakland. He's an Oakland native. He lives there again. And, and the thing is, he knew the characters or at least the archetypes that were on the screen. He knew them personally. He grew up with these people. So for him, the music was representative and the show was representative of his life. So it was intensely personal. And we weren't discouraged in any way from channeling those feelings and and, and that sort of deep personal connection and sometimes pain for people that you've lost, for example, into the show and into the score. And I think that's a very rare thing. Yeah, I agree. And you'd mentioned in like in the vigil or the tax collector how you draw on the emotions that come up it's not simply action horror there are more things going on and you're trying to bring out that personal connection but yeah here it's obviously heightened quite a bit and i guess this speaks to the broader question of the the act of collaborating Mm. with ambrose on this but was it strange for you being someone who's not from this area working with ambrose who i mean was and had such a personal connection or did that channel into your approach to the music as well and you fed off it too oh i was honored it was an education honestly like you know and and the thing is every time we would talk about things you know i felt like i was learning more and going deeper but my experience would never ever in a million years compare to ambrose's and that's almost the point is that he was able to articulate in words and then in music, the different textures of narrative that were going on. He would say, like, that character, that's a multi-layered character. I know that person, for example. (laughs) You know, like, you as a viewer in LA or really anywhere else in the world, I mean, I was proxy for, for, you know, a viewer who wasn't from Oakland in a way. You know, like, I was proxy for, okay, tell me, like, let's translate what you just said into music so that audiences get exactly what you need them to get, you know, and that was kind of the point is that, there's more going on than that was just on the screen, which is exactly what I think the role of film music should be. If it's already on the screen, we don't need to repeat it in the music. You know, if it's already funny, don't repeat the joke. If it's already horrifying, don't slap on the, the scary sounds, you know, if it's already there. So, and, and similarly with drama, you know, if there's more information that's needed, if there is more complexity that's needed, that's what we can bring. And I think those were the types of conversations that Ambrose and I had the whole way along. And I think that comes out a lot because I'm I'm a white guy from the suburbs, so I am very distant from the goings on in the show. And yet, both I mean, the show and and the music amplifies this the personal connection that you can draw and the emotional connection. I mean, there were quite a few moments, especially late in episode six and in episode eight, that the whole series is emotional. But I mean, those like very much impacted me. And I think one of the aspects of it that comes out in the music is there are often times where what you're seeing on screen has a a melancholy to it and that's in the music as well but there's also this undercurrent of a a hopefulness or an optimism that comes through the music and plants the seed in the viewer's head of things can get better and maybe they will in the show maybe they will in season two maybe they maybe they never will but like that hope is always there and like that's something that I really appreciate it as far as the the complexity in those extra layers that you're adding or helping to bring out the music. Yeah, and what's really interesting to me about what you just said is is you've picked up on the arc of the whole series of those eight episodes. You you said that you you really felt something in episode six and episode eight, and that was almost word for word what the filmmakers told us. You know, in terms of the structure of the series, you know, like it builds and builds and builds like to a to a peak in episode six and then another peak in episode eight. That was sort of the direction that we took. They, they are discrete episodes, yes, and that each one has a slightly different tone. But the arc of the emotion 
we were definitely building and we hadn't even seen episode six and episode eight when we started writing. Obviously, we were getting them week by week. So we're like, we're just going to, you know, we're just going to go on this sort of blind faith. We know it's going to get more intense or more emotional and deeper and more complex. And so we were just kind of going with each episode and building and building and building, like knowing that, you know, there were these kind of peaks coming up. I swear no one told me that in advance. <laughs> <laughs> That's great. No, I'm really glad. <laughs> but going back to the, the collaboration aspect, you know, obviously composing for film or TV or any media implicit or I mean explicitly has a collaboration with the director, producer, sound design, everyone. But for most composers, there isn't that collaboration in the composition itself. You'd mentioned that it isn't something that's regular for you. Um, and I'm, I'm, I'm sure that at uh, you know, some point you have worked with other composers. But what was the process like working with Ambrose? You know, was it something that when you knew that you were going to be composing with someone else, that it was uh, an exciting new opportunity and new way to work and to get you know, more influence from another great musician? Yeah, no, absolutely. I mean, like I said, I, I hate repeating myself, you know, in terms of like, I want every score and every sound to be unique. So when this possibility was floated, I was like, hell yeah, I want to do that. Of course, I want to do that. So uh, even though, yeah, like you said, I don't, I don't really work with other composers. It's not something that I've done. I, I, I did it back in Australia, 10 or 15 years ago, I worked with a famous violinist down there. Um, so I knew the sort of the broad rules of composer collaboration. But you know, every every person is different. So I think the the main thing is that when you are working with a composer, it's, it's sort of like being in a band. Like there is no authoritarian voice, right? There is just suggestion. There's no right answer or wrong answer. or There's no like, you have to do it this way or that way. It's really just, what do you think of this idea? Do you like it? No, fine. <laughs> do you hate it? Okay, fine. Let's talk about why. Let's move on. And, it, you know, from both sides. And so it's actually quite a beautiful thing that you're, that there's, that it's almost like there's no ego involved, that you're, that you're just really focusing on the scene. It's like, what works best for the scene? What's, what's the, what's the sound that's going to do it? Does this melody get too much in your face? Does this step on the dialogue? Does this, does this do exactly, does this particular chord progression track the, the emotional arc of this scene, you know, or is this one slightly better? And, I guess the difference is when you're composing by yourself, you, you're making all these decisions and having all these arguments in your own head and you're never mm. translating those thoughts into English. Whereas in a collaboration, you are. You ask those questions of each other, you talk. Um, what was fantastic about this particular collaboration and partly it was COVID-inspired uh, was that Ambrose and I spent hours and days on the phone before we wrote a note. Like, you know, we had written those dance pieces early on, but then before, then there was a little break while they were shooting. And during that time, we just really got to know each other as people. We, you know, we got to know each other about, you know, the, our, our life experience, where we came from. You know, like I said, I'm from Sydney, Australia. I'm from the other side of the world. We got to know stuff about each other's kids and school life and just life in general. We talked about life philosophy. We talked about music, not just film music, but all music. We talked about art. We talked about... I don't know anything, comedy, movies, you name it. And through that, what we were actually doing was developing a collaborative language. And so what we figured out is that we actually share an aesthetic for music in general and, and for what film music can be. So even though we, we naturally write in slightly different languages, uh, although they sort of came together, our judgments are pretty much identical as to what works and what doesn't work. So it was a very easy collaboration from that respect. We never really disagreed on anything musically because we were like, yeah, does that work? Yep. Is that better? Your idea is better than mine. My idea is better than yours. Yep. Yep. Fine, fine, fine. Yep. Present it. Let's go. So. And, and it, I was wondering how that would work with COVID because so often I think you imagine people in the same room, one of you is on the piano, the other is over the person's shoulder or something. Right. But for this, you know, you're, you're talking about the ideas and what might work, what might not. But when it came to actually start recording things, sketching things out, would you be together for that? Or would one of you write something, record it, send it to the other one and you know, do that file transfer? Yeah, it was all remote. The entire season was remote, everything. I mean, this was, don't forget, we finished scoring in, 
I think it was June that we that we finished the final one. So we were still kind of in the throes of not everyone was vaccinated. It was mm. it was it was still pretty much in the height of COVID. I you know we both have young kids. You know we weren't particularly keen on exposing them. You know to like shall I go for a drive up to Oakland and then expose myself and then bring it back to the house or should he come down to LA? It, it, so all of those decisions came into play. And then we added to that the advantage of being able to work remotely so fluidly and so easily. Mm. You know, we could send, we were working in Ableton Live. We were sending just sessions back and forth. It was super easy and it was just working. Uh, what's interesting, I think, is going to be season two because I'm going to guess and we're, you know, that we're really going to try and get in the room together quite a few times. So, you know, it would be interesting to, to see how the season two music compares to the season one music because it will be different. Yeah, interesting. Was this the, the first project that you had scored remotely? I, I don't remember I know the tax collector, I think, came out earlier this year, but I, I don't know when it was scored. No, it was it was the second one that I'd done that I had worked on during the pandemic. And then there was and there's, there's been a couple since then. But but yeah, it was it, it was definitely a new experience. The project I had just finished before Blind Spotting was also strange because that was the first online screenings that i had been a part of so we were doing right you know reviews via evercast and things like that which is now of course common and old hat and nobody blinks at eye like we all review everything on our laptop and headphones and whatever but you know this is the first time i was like i'm not in a mix theater like i'm not listening to everything i can't i'm not <laughs> hearing the music in surround like this is weird but then it was fine <laughs> so <laughs> when the recordings actually happened is is the remote recording an extra obstacle for you? I mean, did that take some getting used to? I, I know you just said that you had another project beforehand that was like that, but is it still a, an additional hindrance or are there any bonuses to that that you don't get live? Well, we were recording as we were going. So okay. as Ambrose would come up with an idea, he would go into a studio and just record it. And same with me and, the, and my pianos and synths mm. here. But I'm very accustomed to remote recording. I've done a lot of it. I've done a lot of recording even before the pandemic in, in Europe and even in Australia. So it nothing was particularly different for me. Uh, it just couldn't leave the house at the end of the day. But other than, you know, <laughs> other than that, it was, it was a pretty normal experience. I guess the only thing where we felt like, oh, wouldn't it be great is, you know, wouldn't it be great if we could, you know, if I could come up to Oakland for a week and just sit in the studio or, or Ambrose could come down to LA and it just wasn't possible on series one, but hopefully on series two. Yeah. And I think that's one of the things that you think of with jazz in particular, that it's a, like this living improvisational thing that is two, three, four, however many people in a room playing and, uh, and something evolves. So I think that that, you know, I, I don't know uh, the sound and the changes that you two might make come season two, but certainly could be something that will add an extra layer or affect some changes maybe maybe overt maybe subtle but will be something to look forward to yeah it's interesting i i have no answer i don't know how it's going to go but uh, but i'm excited <laughs> <laughs> well, cool i mean that's that's exciting and i know obviously you're not sitting here thinking what am i going to do for the next season because it's this first one has already just come out yeah but what else are you thinking about what are you what are you working on what's what's in the pipe and what else is forthcoming Oh, right. Well, I mean, I, uh, yeah, so I'm working on a, without, there's nothing I can name right now. Okay. But I am working on another horror project and I'm working on a series of sort of movies for younger audiences. So like under 10. Oh, interesting. <laughs> um, but of course, you know, when you're writing for young kids, you're also writing for adults. So it's family movies. And so again, jumping around, <laughs> which is, which is what I like to do. But um, my process is always very project specific. I don't tend to think about what I want to do next or, or I don't have these grand concepts. It's like, well, mm. I'd love to do this next or if I do this, this is how I'm going to approach it or whatever. My inspiration really tends to come from the project itself. So when I see the footage and I talk to the director and, 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 and get a sense of what they're trying to achieve, I will try and be as creative as possible within that framework. And that framework, I think, can actually be a really good thing. Like sometimes when the palette is too broad and the blank page is too large, you know, you don't really know what to do. But when you sort of put in a little box, like this is a movie for this particular audience or this is a movie within this genre, go. Now break all the rules that you need to to make it different and awesome. <laughs> <laughs> so is, is that an aspect to your approach then of getting the project, the framework, and then seeing, okay, how far can I push the walls of this box, of this framework, 
before it gets too much and before uh, the the director sends me notes saying, what the hell are you doing? Yeah, I actually think you want the notes. You, you, I think you want the, sometimes you want the, what the hell are you doing? Because that, that tells me that, that we're sort of hitting some of those boundaries. Because often they'll be intermingled with, that's great, that's great, that's too much. You know, that kind of thing. But I think if you don't take risks sometimes in this industry that you're you're not necessarily going to be the exciting option hmm. that, that directors and producers have in front of them. Look, I've always felt that, and I think with, with the people I've worked for, that, that I'm someone who they can go, well, Michael will give us something different. So let's, let's try him on this project, you know. And that's really where I kind of hope to be because a lot of the people who I've worked for don't want to make something that feels or looks like everything else. They want to be like, okay, we're making a sort of a family drama, but it's not going to be like any other family drama. We want to write, flip the whole genre on its head. It's kind of like that. Or, you know, we're going to make a, a Jewish horror film kind of set in Brooklyn, which in itself is unusual. But then actually I want the sound to be like hardcore industrial pain. You know? <laughs> <laughs> and then can you bring in some emotion as well? I like those kind of challenges because it's like, oh, I, ha I haven't heard that score before. That, that score in my mind doesn't exist. I'm going to try and create it, you know. Uh, and similarly with The Tax Collector, that, I mean, that's, The Tax Collector is an emotional film. Like it's wrapped in the blanket of, of you know, action and warfare and, you know, all that. But, but, you know, at its heart, this is a family falling apart. And so I relished that opportunity. I was like, I'm going for the emotion. I'm going, I, I want to move people. <laughs> <laughs> That's got to be a, a way to not just keep from being bored, like you said way earlier on, but to ensure that you as, the, as a composer and as a musician continue to grow and evolve as well. I mean, it's, it's all well and good to continue to do the same thing. Look, you know, some people are fine with that and that's what they're good at and like they're content with it. But yeah, I, I do think that it's also the, the best way to continue to push yourself personally is to just push everything that you're doing as well, to never be in a comfort zone in a way. Well, I'm always trying to learn. I'm always listening to composers of all ages and all backgrounds, uh, listening to them speak and you know, hearing their music, of course, but but more in terms of trying to learn myself as a composer and as and as an artist. I don't. I never want to be stuck in a in a rut where I have one template that I just open in Cubase or whatever every time, and it's just the same instrument palette. And I was like, this is what I work from, and these are my sounds and whatever. Like everything gets updated on a project specific basis. The first thing I always do is build my sound palette and my score palette, which again is not particularly unusual. A lot of composers do it, but it's always a difficult process. It's never. It's never easy to sit and choose sounds that's going to define a whole project. It's always there's always an element of risk involved. There's all there's, there's an element of unknown. It's like where are we going? What are we doing? Is this sound? Is this type of sound going to work? I don't know. And and then it, it, eventually you sort of settle on something that that everybody is comfortable with. But I, I I just never want to be that person who opens the template and starts filling in the dots. That's not me. And how does that? And and maybe there isn't one specific way that it goes, or one way that it goes every time. But I mean, what is that process like when you first sit down and start creating that sonic palette? Um, very scary. <laughs> to me. And, and a lot of the time it's looking for sounds and experimenting with sounds. I, I spend a lot of time, particularly in scores that are more focused on sound design or at least musical sound design. I spend a lot of time looking for sounds that trigger an emotion in me. And sometimes it'll be sample libraries and sometimes it'll be actual live instruments that I buy and start messing around with. For example, I just bought this um, it's a little guitar called a, called a Fanduri from Georgia, the country Georgia, not the state <laughs> and um it, it's just been quite inspiring it's sort of like a ukulele but not quite hmm. and i've just sort of been and i'm not really a guitar player but i've been sort of mucking around with it and just finding tones that i like and it's sort of triggering some things and again this is a pretty standard process for a lot of film composers i think you know a, a film score will start with an internet search of what instruments are out there what's you know what's a strange medieval instrument that doesn't get used very much or things like that or folk instruments and from that you'll start to add things to it like this guitar would pair really well with a traditional ukulele or a traditional guitar and you could build up textures that way and then and then slowly the palette kind of gets built and then from there the way scarier proposition comes in which is you actually have to write melodies and that's <laughs> terrifying <laughs> 
Oh, I bet. Well, you know what? Just make make every score textures and drones, and then you don't have to worry as much. <laughs> that would be great. Yeah, that would be nice to do. And and you know, like I did a drone score called The Devil's Candy a few years back, and that was actually incredibly difficult. You know, because again, in a drone, like there are drones, and then there are drones. You know, so it's like for me, drones that subtly sh- like are these multi layered subtly shifting organisms are more interesting but then of course you're talking about a 40 layered you know 40 track drone and you know also and then it takes a while to put together so i think with creativity you kind of want to push yourself to where it is uncomfortable you never want to sit back and be like ah i held a note down the keyboard that's done you know you always want to just kind of get into that uncomfortable realm of terror and exhaustion (laughs) <laughs> when I, I, you know, I make that suggestion jokingly because I've been a fan of drone music for, I don't know, 10, 15 years. And, and a lot of people give it a bad rap, especially in film music, I think. But like you said, it, for the most part, or at least good drone is not sitting there holding down one key and then 30 seconds later holding down the next key. It is such a complex, layered proposition that sometimes gets overlooked. But I think what you're talking about is my general approach to approaching it to to new styles or styles that I'm less familiar with is that you can't take them for granted. You can't Mm. just assume that because you don't hear complexity, that there isn't complexity there or that you're hearing every part of the sound or that you're aware of what it took to create that sound. And I think a lot of, let's say, simple music, whether it's drones or whatever, gets written off for that reason because audiences don't really understand Okay, yeah, it's just it may be just like three piano notes over a paper bag spinning around in the wind. <laughs> um, but to get to that point, to choose those specific notes, to layer up this kind of really subtle, soft textural pad behind it, that takes years of experience to know how to do that, years of experimentation and and years of tr- like trial and error basically to get to that to, to that point where you're confident enough to present that as a cue. And so it's dangerous, I think, to be dismissive of of simplistic music. I think another part of it, too, is the repetition that's required in listening sometimes. Because, I mean, very often, film music, you know, music for media, or just any other style, Mm -hmm. where you will never get everything in one pass-through. And so it's very difficult and almost disingenuous to make a judgment on a piece of music hearing it once i mean there are so many albums that i have that on the 20th listen using the the right headphones the right speaker you hear some sounds uh, you know a couple notes in one track where you go wow i've i've never heard that before Mm. and i think a lot of us are are guilty of kind of overconsumption sometimes it's so easy especially now but it's important to always have that in the back of your mind, that there's more than what you're hearing, or at least more than what you're processing going on. And then it's interesting also to compare that, and I agree with what you're saying, with, with the view of like a director, and try and, and as a composer, to put yourself in the, in, in the director's chair for a second, and try and understand what, what they are wanting from the music and often it's the immediacy hmm. you know so you're talking about multiple listens and getting deeper and deeper but what a director will want is i want an audience to feel something on one listen i want audiences to get this straight away i don't want to take even half a second for them to know what what i want them to know or what them to feel and uh, david ayer is like that uh, another director who i've worked with 15 years Alyssa down just finished uh, a project with her last year called feel the beat and both of them are very very instinctive have very, very instinctive responses to music. You know, they hear something straight away and within a couple of seconds, they'll say, yep, no. And they're not interested in complexity of of like, wow, could you make it more complex? And I don't know any directors who are. It's like, could you make it more complex? They just want to know, am I feeling when I hear this for the first time? As audiences are going to hear this for the first time because most audiences, you know, experience films once. Are they going to get what I want them to get right away? And so it's the balance of, as composers, we want to be complex and we want to be clever and we want to be musically sophisticated and we want to impress other composers or each other or ourselves. But the perspective of a director and an audience is very different. Then you you can run on the trouble of making it too immediate or too obvious where it feels like a, a blatant manipulation rather than something that's you know, more organic that fits in. 
Is that giant balance something that you you run into, or is that am I am I overstating it? No, I mean I think that the subtlety of it is is something that particularly we were trying to do on on blind spotting because mm -hmm. because for for exactly that reason is that when you when you come in too hard, you know you sort of you, you deny the characters their own voice. And so the music tends to creep in a little later. It says what it's going to say, but it's it's holding back a little bit, particularly under scenes of dialogue. It's not stomping on you. We're not using big, heavy strings and things like that. And there is a place for that, of course. But in a show like this, where dialogue matters, where the rhythm, even when they're not talking in verse, like the rhythm uh, and the tempo with which they speak matters, you know, these characters. So... Yes, exactly. So the the need for subtlety was paramount, and yet at the same time balancing that with the need for really creating that emotional punch. And I think when you also add in that there are numerous needle drops in the show as well, there are all these different elements going on, mm -hmm. and you're balancing the music not just between your music and the picture, but also these other elements too. From the viewer perspective, it does seem like such a delicate balance that fortunately in my opinion, always stays balanced. Yeah. And, all, and again, all credit to the showrunners for that uh, and, you know, for, for picking the moments and balancing this, the moments of the blast of a needle drop, you know, with the sort of the events that happen and just knowing when to to come into one of these sequences and pull out, you know, no, no, they don't stay, they don't overstay their welcome. But as soon as they're out, then we jump in with something or or we stay out for a little bit in terms of you know just giving the the room a moment to breathe and then we might come in on the on the back end of a scene so there was a bit of trial and error obviously at the beginning involved mm -hmm. as to how much we score and you know it, inevitably there are the discussions about you know we don't want music here and ambrose and i would say well are you sure because we can help like you know, you might want it. You might not want it here. We get that. But like in this, in sort of the second half of the scene, we really feel that something could be added or we could express something. And sometimes they would hear and say, yes, absolutely. You're right. And sometimes they would hear and go, no, we were right. So that's part of the process. So I have, I have one more blind spotting related question before we start winding down a little bit. And it's the hardest hitting one of the interview <laughs> okay. so far. So Ambrose briefly appears on screen as a trumpeter in episode eight. Yes. So were you jealous that he gets a cameo and you didn't? <laughs> I, um, if I had if I had performance skills like he did, um, <laughs> yes, I probably would have been jealous. But I really, there's nothing really that I can do. I'm the guy that turns up at weddings and people are like, "Hey, there's a piano in the corner. Michael, play something." And I'm like, "I I can't play anything." Like I I I mean, I used to be a piano player or an, and a clarinet player, but I don't. I have no repertoire. I play the computer. That's what I do. So, so unless he unless he needed like a maybe like a tambourine or a shaker guy behind Ambrose, no, I was fine. The other thing, of course, is that that was shot in Oakland in January during the pandemic. There was it was not going to be possible for me to travel, even if there was a part for me. So yeah, no, no, not at all. Well, you know, maybe maybe that'll be one of the changes come season two. They'll add a brief tambourine part. Exactly. I can I can get my get my tambourine chops happening again. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, and Mike, before I let you go, you did mention a few minutes ago talking about some of the different ways that you improve yourself as a composer and kind of expand your styling horizons. Do you have any pieces of advice as far as how to do that or, or how you do that? Look, the, the 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 biggest cliche bit of advice would just be be open, you know, just be open to everything. Be open to not just film music, but other types of music. Be open to art. Listen to everything. Look at everything. Uh, look at, you know, the work of great directors. Look at the works of directors who knew, who use no music at all because that's really important. You know, the directors who prefer silence and who favor silence in their musical silence in their movies. I think there's so much to learn as a composer from, you know, evaluating those films and making a judgment, you know, as to whether or not you think it would, they would be better with or without music. So the, there's a lot of things in terms of the, the actual craft of film composing that, that I think you get by just exposing yourself to all the other arts. In terms of the actual writing, every, every composer is going to be different. They're going to have their own process. But I mean, you, I often get the question of, you know, well, what plugins do you have or what's, mm. what's in your template or what do you use? And I think my answer to that is always, it doesn't matter at all. Like it really, really doesn't. 
some of the best scores that I've ever heard were made with a laptop and people who had nothing and they were just super creative with what they had you know maybe there's you know a guitar player who plugs their amp in a certain you know like like it's some strange feedback and then loops it using garage band or whatever like it really really doesn't matter so long as you have something that can that, that you can run picture of you know and sync up properly you no know, i think i think sometimes even having less is an advantage to having more because you, you can really craft your own sound and I really think that's important. So the discussions that I have or that I've been aware of where people are choosing composers, it tends to be who's going to give us something different, something fresh, something new, who's got a distinct voice, who's, who's sounding beyond what we've already heard and what we already know. And I don't think you can do that by just buying or trying to hoard what everybody else has. I think you always have to try and be a little bit different. From the, the viewer and the listener, I think that's that's so true that you, you can get your voice across no matter what you have, as long as you have that voice to begin with. Mm. But on that, I, I appreciate the the words of wisdom, Michael. And again, I'm, I'm so glad you could join. It's a shame Ambrose couldn't, but unfortunately it happens. And I'm looking forward to more of your scores and to season two on the hopefully not too distant horizon. Excellent. Thank you so much. I really appreciate it. Of course.